Um, today in, is, uh, is a message that I want to put into the context of, uh, of this season. Uh, we all know what it means to, uh, to come through uh, a time that we call Advent and, and of Christmas, uh, but on January the 6th, uh, we began a new time of year, and, and that time of year is called Epiphany. And, and, and for some of us, what we may know of Epiphany is, is really just when, uh, whenever we hear that word and, and someone says, I've had an epiphany, which means that suddenly something has become clear to them, something has become new, and something has become fresh. Now, in the context of uh, Christianity, in the context of uh, the community of faith, uh, Epiphany is that time when Christ is revealed. Uh, Christ is revealed to the world. That's the coming of the Magi from other parts of the world who come to see him. Um, it's Christ becoming known to us as those who are not a part of his race, but who are Gentiles. And so Epiphany is the time of year when a lot of churches focus on mission and on outreach. So we're having a problem again today. Uh, so um, I think that happened to me the last time I was over here. So uh, it, it's that time when we get to focus on our moving out beyond our walls. So one of the things that I'm really pleased about this year uh, is that uh, our mission celebration, which uh, focuses on outreach, uh, is going to be held uh, during the season of Epiphany this year. It's going to be held in February. And so you've already begun to see information about that, and we're going to gather here uh, on a number of occasions, February 21st, 2nd, and 3rd, uh, as we focus on what God is calling us to do, not only here in this community, but well beyond this community in our nation and around the world. And so it's in that context um, that we hear the scripture reading today that calls us not just to mission, but that it also calls us to share God's good news in Jesus Christ uh, with this world. Now, um, the passage of scripture we're gonna look at in just a moment is from uh, Old Testament book of Isaiah. It's chapter 49, and we're gonna look at verses one through seven. And while that's gonna be on the screen in a moment, um, it's also printed in your worship folder. And I did that because I'm going to be going back and making reference uh, to different portions of this over and again uh, throughout the message this morning. So in preparation for this message, um, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm finding at, at my age uh, is nostalgia comes more often all the time, okay? And so um, I, I got to thinking uh, about a series of commercials that um, actually begin to date me, and if you're familiar with them, uh, they're going to date you also. Uh, so let's see if some of you remember those. Um, in the days before everyone had personal communication devices, in the days when landline telephone companies competed with one another to provide us with the best long distance service, and the way they did that was they tried to grab hold of our emotions just like a good Hallmark Christmas commercial, okay? Uh, so in short, in the days when dinosaurs roamed the earth, um, there was a series of commercials, and in going back and, uh, and looking, uh, doing a, an internet search, I was surprised to find out uh, just how far back these actually dated. But there was a telephone company that used this little song that started out, reach out and touch someone. You remember that? Some of you are remembering that. Reach out and touch someone. Call up and just say hi. Okay. All right. Nobody in first service knew that. Julie knew it. Okay. Uh, so call up and just say hi. Reach out and touch someone. You got to be careful with that one because today that would get you arrested. So be careful with that one. Um, and and what I came, what I found out was this is thirty plus years old. Those things started in the 1970s, folks. 
And, and that really was, um, that re really was quite a, a jar for me because it really does date me. But what they did was they used some very realistic um, situations, family and friend situations, always joyous ones. And the goal was to get people to connect with one another, to get them to call each other. And what the long distance company was really saying was go ahead and call someone and stay in touch. So when the prophet Isaiah comes on the scene, God was calling him to reach out to other people. God was calling him as prophet. God was calling the servant in this passage of scripture to reach out to those who are dear to the heart of God because God wanted to communicate God's love for them. Did you notice that as a theme in the, script, in, the, um, in the songs that we sang this morning? It's about the extravagant nature of God's love and the reaching nature of, of God's love. I, I went up to Corey before this service started and, and said, I, I want to thank you because we didn't, he knew my text and he knew title and he knew theme and, and, and subject, uh, but he didn't know much other than that. And, and I thought that he just was really inspired in God leading him uh, to choose some of those songs. So let's hear what the scripture says to us today from Isaiah chapter 49 and it's verses one through seven. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow in his quiver. He hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength, he says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to the deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers, kings shall see and stand up princes and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful the holy one of Israel who has chosen you if there is a theme verse in this reading it is actually verse 6 and it's the second half of verse 6 that says I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth now one of the things that I shared last week because I used another passage from Isaiah in the other worship setting uh, was we really don't know who this servant is that it keeps talking about. We don't know if the servant is Israel as a nation. We don't know if the servant is actually the prophet who is writing and who is being told what to say. We don't know if really like the New Testament sees it that it's talking about Jesus here. And even when you get into that very last verse, the early church, as it looked back, took that last verse and saw in it the coming of the wise men, the coming of the magi. But here's the bottom line. As we read this text, and, and, and perhaps it's somewhat of a reach, but I'll go ahead and, and do the reach. Propose to you that uh, this servant uh, is, is us today, even as, as the church. The, the servant continues to be us as the people of God who are being called by God. And, and, and what it is that we're being called to is to recognize that we are, have been 
that we have been given much in the way of God's love. God's grace and God's mercy has been poured out upon us. And, and so that which we have received, we are to be freely giving to others. So I believe that Isaiah can still speak to us today because every Christian, everyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ, is called to share that with other people, to reach out, to reach out and touch someone, if you will, with this good news of Jesus Christ. And that everyone in the church, everyone in the body of Christ, this servant, like the servant describes, has this as a part of who we are. Now, last Sunday, uh, I believe in this setting, as we did in uh, the other worship setting, uh, you had the opportunity to reaffirm your baptismal vows. And so you had the opportunity to come here to the font and to dip your hand into the water, and I believe to, to take a stone, a stone of remembrance, to remember your baptism and to rejoice and to be thankful. You may may have touched your forehead uh, with the water. You may have just uh, felt it upon your hand. And as you did, what that does is it reminds us. It reminds us of who we are and of whose we are. It may be that you're still very much on your journey to belief and, and you came to the water. And as you dipped your hand into that water, you knew that God's grace has been a part of your life and God has been doing amazing work in your life uh, through the years, bringing you to the place where... So in verse 1 of the scripture today, uh, and, and this is my synthesis of, of all of that verse. In verse 1 of the scripture, it says that the Lord called me from the womb. Now, the scriptures have a really profound understanding that God creates each one of us in the womb. And it's not to be seen just here, but it's seen in the psalmist, it's seen in the prophet Jeremiah, that God makes us for a purpose and that you and I are a part of God's plan. And God's plan is to shape us, to shape us for further use and for further service in this world. Now, Isaiah even says there that God names us. And naming uh, is just really important. I mean, parents spend a lot of time when a child comes to them in choosing what they believe is just the right name uh, for that child. When a child is brought for baptism in our tradition, uh, they are named as a part of that service. And so naming is so important. God names us. And it says to us that God values us in that way. But the other part of that, the other dimension of that, is recognizing that we're also given another name. As we become followers of Jesus Christ, we take on his name. And in taking on his name in this world, then our goal is to share what's so important about that relationship with other people so that they likewise can come to the place that they accept that for themselves. Now, that comes to us in many different ways, our own sense of security about what it is that we're about and, and what it is that we do in this life. A number of ways that God's word comes to us uh, is certainly through the scriptures. That may be scriptures that are on a printed page. It may be scriptures that are, uh, are electronic and, or digital and that you are seeing in that way. Scripture and the word of God comes to us in ways through the spoken word uh, as scripture is read aloud as scripture is being preached from. Scripture, the word of God comes to us as we are in Sunday school or perhaps in a small group. Um, scripture comes from our own searching. The word of God comes to find that place in us that it develops in us and we develop a sense of security about what God is wanting to do in it and through it to use us for our life in this world. And so as we do that, we grow in confidence about what it is. It, Hebrews chapter 
4 and verse 12 says that the Lord of God, the word of God is living and it is active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit and it discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Now, we believe that scripture has been given to us, uh, has been given to this world in order to change this world and to change the lives of those to whom it is spoken uh, to make us new persons. And so with that, we believe that there's value in it and we believe that there is power in it and we have seen that power at work, uh, perhaps in our own lives. We've seen it at work in the lives of others who are being transformed. But we've also had those moments when we recognize that there really just seems to be a struggle. Uh, maybe we're struggling after a period of time. Uh, we, we think that we've been a Christian for a good while, uh, and, and life just does not seem to be going well. Uh, maybe we no longer search God's word for what it has to say to us. Uh, maybe we think we know what it says, and we err in thinking we know what it says rather than searching it for ourselves. Um, sometimes along the way, uh, we, we develop concerns about why God's word uh, is, is not being received by others in this world. Maybe why our influence is not the kind of influence that we believe that God is calling us to have. And there's all kinds of folks that can bear witness that they've had that kind of experience. So if, if you've been on your path for a while, or if you've been on a path where you've begun to develop some doubts about whether uh, the influence uh, of your faith uh, or the influence of Christian faith uh, around the world is, is still valid, then um, I, I would say to you, look and see what um, is being said through the prophet Isaiah here today. In the fourth verse, Isaiah, it's almost as Isaiah knows what we're feeling. It's as though he has been struggling with this as well. He mourns. He says, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. And we, and we buy into that sometimes. When we look at our world that seems to be filled with greed, when we look at our world and, and we're struggling with all of the violence that we see, when we see wrongs that are being unchecked, when we realize that we have sought to be faithful either individually with those that we're in covenant relationship with or as a church, and nothing seems to be making a difference. Nothing seems to be making a dent. So um, particularly for those of you uh, who, um, who take up that name as, as Christian, uh, as believers, and that may be for a short period of time or maybe your journey has been going for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years, in, in the midst of those occasions when you're experiencing uh, discouragement, uh, discouragement as a disciple, as a Christ follower. I, I want to say to you that, that I believe that Isaiah is, is having that same struggle here this morning. He is wanting to be faithful. He's wanting to do exactly what God is calling him to do, but he's articulating some of these things that we struggle with. In, the, in verse 2, first I would say that in verse 2, he's reminding us that God hid us in the shadow of his hand. It says, in the shadow of his hand, he hid me. That's in verse 2. Now, while that's Old Testament, if you were to go over into the New Testament, to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3, it says there that our lives are hid in Christ. And what that means is that we're protected by our Lord from the forces of evil in this world. That the message about God's mission in this world as God's servants is going to continue uh, regardless. God is going to be faithful in that. And, and this is one of those places where as I was singing and as I was listening to the songs this morning, that very first one, Open Our Eyes, it says that our God is fighting for us always. We are not alone. And so we need to hear that in those moments when we're feeling discouraged about our ministry and our mission, we need to hear that our God is fighting for us. And it also said, and I fear not all my enemies, for you are right here with me. 
So that's the message of God as it comes to us through song and it's consistent with what we're seeing here. So the first thing is that we are hid in the shadow of his hand. The second thing that I see here in Isaiah is in verse 4. It says that my cause, our cause is with God and my reward is with God. So we need to remember that if we're seeking to be faithful, that our cause is with God and our reward is with God. And that means that our judgment and the judgment of anyone else concerning our success uh, as the servants and the disciples of the Lord, uh, what they think is, is meaningless. The world around us may even laugh at our efforts to be the Lord's servants. The Lord may laugh at our being an instrument of God's inviting spirit in the world, but the world also laughed at Jesus dying on the cross. There's a sense as you look at that passage of Scripture that you see that that the servant there, there's a foreshadowing there of the suffering servant that the early church said, in fact, was Jesus. So at times when everything may seem useless to us, God alone is the one who judges your and my effectiveness. The God alone is the one who brings the fruit forth. Now, I'll tell you, there, there are some days that, that I leave here at the end of a day uh, and, and I wonder, you know, what did I give to God today, okay? There are some days when, whether I've been here on campus or whether I've been in the community, and I get home and, I, and I'm thinking, what, what did I do for the kingdom of God today? And so sometimes it's, it is reasonable for us to ask as a matter of introspection, as a matter of our own soul searching, are we giving God anything to work with, Okay. What are we giving God to work with? Are we doing anything that actually can bear fruit? Now, I grew up with a, with a lot of gardening going on. We, we didn't just do small gardens where I grew up. We did acres of, of gardens. My family thought if they didn't have an acre and a half of garden that the world was going to come to an end, okay? And, and so one of the things about myself is that I, I can really appreciate other people's really beautiful garden, uh, but if I do any, it's probably going to be in some rather small containers. I got burned out as a child, okay? Um, so uh, the piece about that is if, if we don't plow, if we don't plant the seed, if we don't work it, uh, we're not likely to have the fruit that we're going to enjoy. We may get to enjoy someone else's fruit. But what is it that we are doing then that brings forth fruit for the kingdom of God? So the third thing, if, if you're on your journey and you're struggling with disappointment about the effectiveness of, uh, of, of your labors and uh, of your faithfulness, um, the third thing is in verse 5. In the midst of discouragement, we can, as Isaiah writes, say that my God has become my strength. Would you say that with me? My God has become my strength. And so that's an important word to us. It's an important word of affirmation and encouragement. So in God, by the work of the Holy Spirit, our work for the gospel is not in vain because my God has become my strength. So when, whenever you're experiencing, you're seeking to be faithful, but there are those moments of discouragement. Remember in verse 2, my God has hidden me in his hand, and that means that he watches over me. The second thing is our cause and our reward is with God, and that's in verse 4. And then the third thing, God has become my strength. Now, when you look at this passage as a whole, did you notice that um, Isaiah, the servant, is being called on, on one level to be faithful to his own people? Okay, he's, he's being called to be faithful to those that are, uh, are of the, the people, the nation of, uh, of Israel, to, to his neighbors and to his other tribes. A and that is good. A and usually we do a pretty good job of, of taking care of ourselves. We do a pretty good job of taking care of those that are like us and, and that are immediately around us. But this passage really pushes us beyond that, doesn't it? Remember that sixth verse that I said to you, if there's a theme verse, this is it. 
I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. You see, that's what God is inviting us to be a part of. Not just about me and my four and no more. Not just about my own comfort zone, but well beyond this place. And so it's like God is saying to the servant, you think it's gotten hard up to this place? I'm about to send you out into the world to be a light to all people. You think your attempts up until this point to live and spread the gospel have been in vain where you are, I'm going to give you an even bigger opportunity and that is to spread the gospel throughout the world so that people everywhere can be saved. And so here, that's in Isaiah. But when we move into the gospels in the New Testament, Jesus sends his disciples. Where does he send them? He says for them to go into all the world. Okay? And when our forefather in the faith, John Wesley, comes along, and those of us in the Wesleyan tradition, we remember that Wesley said that the world is my parish. And so the world in which we live and move and live into our calling gets bigger and bigger all of the time. So friends, as, as you come to this passage of Scripture this morning, I want you to hear that on the one hand, we are folk who have experienced God's truly extravagant love. And as we have experienced that love, we are grateful for it. You and I, I found myself as, as I was singing this morning, thinking about how blessed I am. And I claim my blessings not because I've pulled myself up by my own bootstraps or because I have what I have because I work hard. I claim my blessings because God's faithfulness is from everlasting to everlasting and God's goodness is beyond description. And so I'm able to take that in for myself and, and the words in that song mentioned uh, are at close there with capturing my heart again. And so there are times when our hearts need to be captured again. And, and, and this is a time early in this year that, that I want to ask you about that. Does God need to capture your heart again? Now, I don't know if you buy into this thing about New Year's resolutions. Uh, for a long time, I... You know, I tried that thing of making a New Year's resolution. And you know what I found out? I found I didn't get very far into the year before I was sunk, okay? You know, I, I didn't get very far into the year before I'd kind of given up my New Year's resolution. And, and it was because, you know, I was giving up or, or making New Year's resolutions for things that really didn't matter a whole lot. I'm going to drink less coffee, okay, you know. If I drink less coffee, I just, I won't even be Mickey anymore. Okay, uh, so, um, uh, and it doesn't even have to be good coffee, so, you know, what's it matter? Um, so, you know, what I've learned through the years is that I approach this new year um, with what's God's spirit saying to me. What, where, where's God seeking to draw me into partnership with God this year? So I, I want to ask you as I'm, we move to this place of closing, um, God, uh, let me say to you, God, God knows you. God has known you from the womb according to his word. Um, God uh, has called you. God's called every one of us. And the reality is that God may have been calling some of us for a long, long time now, Okay. Now, some of us this morning uh, will recognize that we're on a journey um, that's just beginning. And if you're here this morning and you're on your spiritual journey toward a profession of your faith, um, then my, my hope and my prayer for you uh, is that you are seeking to remain open, that God's drawing you more and more to, God, to God's center where you can claim who Jesus is, that he is who he says he is, that he is the Son of God, and that he died for you, that you may live. 
And you may be here this morning and God's been working on you for some time now. I want you to know that God cares for you and God wants you to come home where you are loved. Won't you respond to that call? Won't you let this be the day where you accept that for yourself? So the second part of the invitation is for those who God is inviting by God's Holy Spirit to be as instruments of, of mercy and peace in this world. And, and you know if that's you. You know if God has been working on you for some time to, to reach out and touch someone in, in a positive way. Um, you know whether God is, is working uh, in your life to use you um, to, um, to share your faith with someone who is a family member or a friend uh, or a co-worker uh, and to be an example for them that they can find their way to God. You may be here this morning and you're someone that God has, uh, has been working on calling you to a new area of service or a new area of ministry. And um, while you recognize that God's been calling you to that, you've got many excellent reasons why you're not going to do that, okay? Um, so one of the things that I learned, and, and someone asked me the other day, they said, how old were you when you uh, had your first church, when you started to preach? Um, I preached my first sermon when I was 18 years old, and uh, I started pastoring a few months later when I was 19. Uh, but the thing that I learned um, some years later in my late 20s is that the one who God calls, God equips, okay? I mean, that's an affirmation of faith, friends. If God calls you, God is going to equip you. It can't be any other way. It would be inconsistent with the nature of God for God to call you and not equip you. So if you have been dealing with that place in your life and you know that it's God calling and you've got many excellent reasons for not answering it I would just ask you can this be the day can this be the time and the season of the year when you realize that it's God who is inviting you to partnership with his extravagant love for this world and you say yes to that so how about it Whoever you are, wherever you are on your journey of faith, are you ready to go where God is inviting you to go? To do what the Spirit is inviting you to do? To be who God made you to be and called you to be? And when you start to think about that, who God called you to be is one who follows His Son. And if God has called you to follow His Son, that means that you are becoming more and more like Him. And if you are becoming more and more like him, then you are taking on the name of his son. You're taking on the name of Christ. So may you live into that calling very fully in this new year. Would you pray with me? We are here, O oh God, among your called. And we have heard and we have answered your summons. You have addressed us in some of the deepest places of our lives. In responsive obedience, we testify as we are able to your truth as it concerns our common life. And we thank you for the call. We thank you for the burden of that call. We thank you for the risk that goes with it. We thank you for the joy of words given to us by your growing spirit and for the newness that sometimes comes from our world. We have indeed been in the counsel of your summoning spirit, and so we know some truth to speak already. But we are as well filled with rich imaginations of our own, and our own imagination is sometimes matched and overmatched by our cowardice, by our readiness to please others and by our quest for comfort and well-being. Oh God, we are on most days a hard mix of one who's called to be a prophet and one who is a wayward voice. We're a mix of your call to justice and a hope for peace and shalom. But here we are, as we are, mixed but faithful, compromised but not committed, 
anxious but devoted. Would you use us? Use our gifts by your newness that pushes beyond all that we can say or all that we can imagine. So we thank you for your great graceful words that are given to us. If you're here this morning and God has been calling you to a place where you might accept Jesus as the Lord of your life and and you're at that place, but you're not sure about the words. There, there are no set words to do it. But I invite you to say these words with me in the silence of your own heart if you are moving toward that place of acceptance. Dear Jesus, I accept that you love me and you have made me. I accept that you have created me for yourself. Forgive me of all of the things that separate me from you. Come into my life and into my heart. And may I begin this day anew in your love and in your grace as one who hasn't figured it all out yet but who is on the way. And if God has called you to a place of ministry and mission and you have not said yes to that, can you lay aside your excuses this morning and say, yes, God. I trust that you have called me and that you will equip me. Jesus' name.